Last Monday, we talked about Leaky Black being the unsung instigator in Carolina's victory at Virginia Tech. This Monday, we start on Leaky Black again, but for a less exciting and more unfortunate reason. Carolina once again got big production from an unlikely source, and Armando Baycott did something that literally no Tar Heel basketball player has ever done. We're going to talk about all of that today on Locked on Tar Heels. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Monday, February 28th, 2022, uh, the last day of February. I wish we could get every month going on this 28-day thing. I think it's called like the International Fixed Calendar. Look it up. You're going to be glad you did. It's a whole thing. It'll blow your mind. Anyway, welcome to the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for making Locked On Tar Heels your first listen every single day. Don't forget that we are free and available on all podcasting platforms. Wherever you get it, go and subscribe. And this is our first ever show right here on YouTube. Do it, do it, do it. Subscribe right now. Please hit that bell so you get notified when new episodes come out. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Uh, before we get into everything, what a Saturday in college basketball. The top six AP teams all lost literally never happened before in the history of college basketball. Seven of the top nine lost. Texas Tech went down as well. This is awesome. It's late February. It's so close. Selection Sunday is two weeks away. We're getting there. On top of all the basketball excitement, this is a crazy full and busy week for Carolina sports. There's a lot to get to. Here's some of what's going on. Spring football practice starts tomorrow, Tuesday. It's the last week of the regular season in men's basketball, including playing at Duke on Saturday and what I'm calling hashtag ruin a retirement party. Let's get that going. Uh, the women's basketball team has secured a top four seed in the ACC tournament, which will be this week. Uh, they won 74-46 over Duke yesterday on Sunday. The baseball team is off to a 6-1 and one start, including winning a series this weekend over top 25 ECU. Lots going on in Carolina sports, but... We have to start with men's basketball today. On Saturday, Carolina won at State 84-74 in a game that actually felt like Carolina won by like 20, but the scoreboard said 10, whatever. We're going to get to Armando's place in history, what he did in just a few minutes, but we need to start on Leaky Black. I mentioned off the top that uh, we needed to talk about him this Monday for a less exciting reason, and that is because Leaky Black's health status is in question. If you didn't see the game, uh, late in the last half of the first half, went up to contest a shot, came down a little awkwardly, uh, <clears throat> and his, his right knee buckled a little bit, and those non-contact injuries, you know how that goes, right? So immediately my brain goes, oh, that's an ACL, Leaky's done, it's all over, right? And so he, he left the court, did come back out to the bench in the second half, was dressed. We learned that, thankfully, it was not an ACL, and there was no structural damage to the knee, which is one of those things you're always looking at with knee injuries, and that it was a hyperextension. The word was that if needed, he could play, although he said he felt like perhaps he couldn't. Thankfully, the game was well in hand, and so there was no need or no reason to try to get him back in. Based on comments from what Coach Davis said post game, I expect Leaky Black to be able to play tonight against Syracuse, especially it's his senior day. You want him to be able to do that. However, if not, uh, I would expect one of two different players to be the one to jump in for him in the starting lineup. I would say either Dontrez Styles or Puff Johnson. Either one is going to be getting their first start in a Carolina uniform if Leakey can't go. Based on what we've seen this year, based on what Coach Davis has said about those two younger players, I would expect that if Leakey can't go, it would be Puff Johnson who would get the nod just from everything he brings offensively and defensively, his length, 
Um, the way he is attacking the rim, can score from outside, uh, battling for rebounds, uh, drawing charges, doing things. Uh, I think, especially in a game where you need someone who you can trust and rely, guard buddy Beheim. we'll talk about that later, that Coach Davis, in the event that Leakey can't go, would rely on Puff Johnson. Now, when we think about Leaky Black, you know, it might seem like, oh, you know, a guy missing from the lineup doesn't score all that much and, um, you know, just doesn't bring a lot. But it, it, with Leaky, it's his intangibles that you're really missing. And so you, you know that you need that. And think about everything that Leaky has seen and been through. Let me run you through his four years at Carolina. You ready? His freshman year came in with two current NBA players, Kobe White, Nasir Little, Carolina was a one seed that year. You might recall Iona gave him like sickness in the first round, and then they eventually lost to Auburn the next weekend. Uh, just not people not feeling good, but Auburn did beat Kentucky later, so we'll allow them a little bit of that. His sophomore year, that was the Cole Anthony year. Injuries all over the place. COVID saved Carolina from missing the tournament, right? Which they totally would have done. Leakey's junior year last year, another up and down year for Carolina. Third straight freshman point guard, Roy Williams last year. Just so much going on. And then you come to this year. And Leakey has, it feels like he's finally for the first time in his four years, found his his place, his role as a Tar Heel. He's defending team's best players. We know what he's done to the likes of DeVoe from Georgia Tech and Sebron from NC State. Uh, he's found some shooting, really hitting those corner threes, attacking more. He's had two strong dunks the last two games. And, uh, like, Leakey is one of those players that just because of what he's done, I just feel like we will not fully appreciate him until he's gone you know how sometimes you get to the end of a player's career and you look back and it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, you were awesome and you added so much value and we just didn't see it. I feel like Leaky Black has been the recipient of so much, I don't know, vitriol is probably too strong a word, but just like, oh, we don't need Leaky Black. He's not it. And folks, that is wrong. You will miss Leaky Black something fierce when he's gone. I'm just telling you. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, I talk about Leaky Black being gone. Yes, it is his fourth year. Yes, he's a senior. However, keep in mind that those who were in college when COVID hit have the opportunity to come back if they would like to. Uh, that's not been ruled out. Leaky hasn't said anything about not coming back. Coach Davis hasn't said anything about that. And so it sounds like that is something we need to uh, at least open uh, our thoughts up to the the fact that Leaky might come back and how good and crazy would that be? Keep in mind, our, our best understanding is that if he does come back, it would not count against the scholarship math. That's something we will talk about another time. Now, as I said off the top, because of what happened to Leaky Black, another Tar Heel, just like Leaky last week, an unlikely source was able to bring some thunder for Carolina on Saturday. We're going to get into that in just a moment in Armando's Baycott historic performance. But first, I need to tell you about Bet Online. Football might be over for the season, but basketball is full go. The NBA is back from the All-Star break. Selection Sunday, as we said, is just two weeks away. And so from all the latest odds, totals, player performance props, to where the next fired coach is going to land, Bet Online is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs, plus game scores, podcasts, and the latest news. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net's College World Series Championship odds are out. Texas leads the way at 15 to 2 odds, but Carolina is coming in at 80 to 1. So a good value play. As I said, they're off to a 6 and 1 start. Wouldn't be surprised if they got ranked soon. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Thank you so much for making uh, Locked on Tar Heels your first listen every day. I'd love to encourage you wherever you listen to podcasts to subscribe. And now, seeing here on YouTube, not only can it be your first listen every day, it can be your first watch every day. So please go and subscribe on YouTube as well. Hit that bell so you can get notifications when new episodes drop. Uh, so the unlikely candidate, who was that? What happened? Well, Puff Johnson is that man. Let's not beat around the bush with it. Let's just get right to the point. 
Puff Johnson, you, you know his story, you know what he's been through, uh, came in last year as a freshman, just dealt with all sorts of injuries, thought like, hopefully, man, he's going to be able to come back this year, do some great things, but no, he once again dealt with injury at the beginning of the season, but Coach Davis has been saying great things about who he is as a teammate, who he is as a hard worker, coming back, trying to really get himself in a position to do great things to help this team. He's been a great cheerleader on the sidelines, uh, honestly celebrating his teammates' success often more than his own. But what Coach Davis has said is that you will earn your playing time through practice and then through defense and things like that. And so when we've seen Puff Johnson get on the floor, we, we automatically see what he brings. There's this energy. There's this willingness to do whatever. Yes, he is going to be a great three-point shooter like Cam was and is for the Suns. What a year they're having. Holy cow. Although now they've just lost back-to-back games. Yikes. Get it together. Although Chris Paul's out. Anyway, that's a whole nother story for another day. Puff's got that height similar and that length similar to Cam. Um, he seems to be, uh, to me, a little more aggressive in his play, both, both offensively and defensively. And so on Saturday, what did he do? Well, he came in, dropped 16 points, easily a career high, fought for lots of rebounds, got several rebounds, uh, got fouled on a three, made all three, three, all, all three free throws, also made two three-pointers, had a nice dunk in transition, just doing the little things that you need someone to do to, to win. He's making winning plays. Some of them, yes, show up in the stat sheet. Not all of them do, but the coaches see it. They know what he's bringing. Puff Johnson, what a guy bringing new stuff to Carolina. Now, I said that Armando Baycott did something that nobody else in Carolina history has done. I, like, I was at the point where I, I'm thinking, okay, Armando Baycott, yes, he's doing just incredible things game after game after game, right to the point where we're almost like, all right, Armando, you're going to, oh, you didn't get 15 and 15? Oh, that, you'll do better next time, right? <laughs> like, he's just doing ridiculous things. And so I thought I had seen everything Baycott had to offer us, but I was wrong. He went out on Saturday and uncorked a 28-point, 18-rebound, 5-block performance. In the history of North Carolina basketball, and think about all the, the history littered with just stud performances, no player ever has had 25 points, 15 boards, and 5 blocks. Baycott did that. And I, I hate it. He was just shy. He had a, a layup in the final minute that just went off. One of He was 11 for 13 from the floor. So just one of two missed shots. But that would have given him 30 and 15 and 5. And then two more rebounds and he would have had 30 and 20 and 5. That's crazy to think about. And, and honestly, he missed several minutes down the stretch because of foul trouble. Got his fourth foul. Uh, I think it was about 6.30, 6.45 to go and had to uh, come out of the game for a while. And so had he stayed in, I would imagine 30 and 20 and five would have been a very realistic thing. But he did, uh, even with those numbers, obviously have another double-double. That's up to 22 this season. One more if he gets one against Syracuse, which we'll talk about in just a second. He will tie Bryce Johnson for the single-season Carolina record and then maybe have a chance to break it at Duke on Saturday. Armando Baycott, bro, you are crazy. Okay, before we leave the game from Saturday night, we have to talk about the shady stat of the game. And it is this. Carolina's free throw shooting, you've probably heard how good it's been this season. Uh, Carolina has, has struggled at times in recent years, not always been a great free throw shooting team. Uh, this year is the exact opposite of that. You know the jump and the leap that they've made with their three-point shooting. The same is true with their free throws. Let me tell you just some of these numbers. This is the Isaac Shady, Shady stat of the game. Last three games, 13 of 15 at Virginia Tech, 11 of 13 at versus Louisville, and then Saturday, 21 of 23 at NC State. So they've missed just two free throws each of the past three games. That's a combined 45 of 51. And you ready for this percentage? 
88.2%. Carolina is shooting as a team over the course of the last three games. That is a shady stat of the day that you can wrap your brain around. Now, let's think about the, the season-long variety. Carolina has hit 407 of their 532 attempts from the free throw line. That's 76.5%, again, as a team. That's so crazy. Can you wrap your head around that? If the season ended today they would have the second highest free throw percentage in Carolina recorded history. The only team that is better is the 1983-84 Tar Heels hit 78.3% of their free throws as a team. That is just otherworldly, right? That's that's the best, and right now the second best is almost two whole percentage points less than that. That team was just hitting it lights out. Now, we always have our shady stat of the game, Isaac Shade. People always call me shady, right? We got to lean into it. We need some sunglasses. I should get sunglasses for the shady stat of the game. Okay, I'm doing that uh, after the Syracuse game. It's happening. Bet. Okay, we also need a shady stat of the game, like the the uh, underside, the uh, seedy underbelly of shady. So today's shady stat of the game is Carolina's turnovers. For a while, Carolina was doing pretty well. The first um, 23 games of the season were averaging 11-something a game, and then the last six had been averaging 9.3. But the most recent six games, they've averaged 14.3 turnovers a game. Um, now, in the Roy Williams era, that would have been a little more acceptable, a little more doable. Why? Well, because you are going so fast and have so many possessions that you can expect a higher number of turnovers, even though the percentage is, is about equal. Carolina just isn't playing that fast now under Hubert Davis. They're still up, up tempo. They're going to run when they can and, and do that, but... Averaging 14.3 turnovers of a game is no bueno. And so that's what they've done the last six. And as I said, the prior six games before that were only averaging 9.3 turnovers a game. That's awesome. Like if you can get down into averaging single digit turnovers a game, that's where you want to live. And so Carolina is going to have to adjust and do better in that way going forward. Hopefully they can do that against Syracuse tonight, Monday night, when Carolina will wrap up the home portion of their season. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but first let me tell you about Built Bar. Built Bars are great candy bar replacement options which are covered in 100% real chocolate. Some of the great flavors include mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month, we're at the end of the month now, but it is new this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. Can you hear that? Yes, give me all of that. These are all delicious and new flavors are coming out for Built Bar all the time. And at Built Bar, they are all about the taste. They make it taste delicious first and then figure out how to make it healthy. And I don't know how, but they always pull it off. Now, if you're thinking about typical candy bars, it can be anywhere from two to 300 calories, but most Built Bars have just about 130. And so I'd love for you to go to built.com, scroll down to the macros chart and see numbers like that, those 130 calories or just the four grams of sugar or only four net carbs. You live in that keto life trying to get down from the Christmas weight. Yeah, I get that. And it's up to 17 grams of protein. So let me encourage you, go to built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your next order. That's pro, uh, LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Tonight, 7 o'clock on ESPN's Big Monday, right there inside the Smith Center, North Carolina, hosting Syracuse, the final home game of the season. And you know what that means. It's senior night. We'll talk about that in just a second. But let's talk about the weirdness of it's the 19th game of the ACC season, and you're facing a team for the first time, right? You've played all these other teams twice already, and now in the penultimate ACC game of the season, you play a team for the first time in Syracuse. That's odd, and it's weird, and very difficult to face Syracuse on the back end of a two-day turnaround. So we'll talk about that in just a second. But first, let's put some attention to senior night. Let's honor these young men and everything they've done. Uh, obviously, Brady Manick will be one of those going through senior day activities. He came in as a grad transfer from Oklahoma. So unfortunately, this is his one and only season with Carolina, which Brady Manick, 
Thank you for coming to North Carolina. What a revelation you have been, uh, just bringing maturity, bringing just a knowledge of the game, uh, being a distributor, hitting those threes. Uh, he, he wasn't hitting where he wanted to earlier in the season, but he's doing much better with that now. Also, Ryan McAdoo uh, is one of the seniors. Um, you might know uh, the relation there with Bob McAdoo. And so Ryan McAdoo will be going through senior day things as well. And then also Leaky Black. As I said, we we don't know if he will decide to come back or not, and so we're going to have to wait and see on those things, and again, if he'll be able to play or not. I would imagine since it's senior day, they might do something. You know how Carolina will always start all the seniors. Even if Leakey can't go tomorrow night, I, I wonder if they would try to just get him on the court and uh, like maybe Baycott tips the jump ball out of bounds and they check Leaky out or something. I don't know. I, I just would imagine they're going to try to get him on the court for senior night somehow. Okay, let's talk about Syracuse. Syracuse comes in at 15 and 14 overall, 9 and 9 in the ACC. They're in eighth place. Uh, just isn't that where Syracuse always is this time of year? And then they make some kind of run in the tournament because people don't know how to play against a zone. We'll talk about that soon. So Syracuse, as always, is led by Bayheim, And I intentionally make it general because, yes, Jim Bayheim is the head of the snake. But both uh, two sons, Buddy and Jimmy Bayheim, are both on this year's roster. They are the first and then tied for second leading scorers. Buddy leads the team at 19.1. Second in the ACC behind only Alondis Williams of Wake Forest, who we know is having a phenomenal year, leading the league in both scoring and assists. Crazy. That is Trey Young type stuff there. Jimmy Beheim and Joe Girard are tied for second on the team with 13.4 points per game. Uh, But Girard also leads the team in assists at 4.2, which is fifth in the ACC, leads the team in steals at 1.7. Uh, Big man Jesse Edwards, though, he is second in the ACC in both field goal percentage at 69.5% and blocks per game at 2.8. So Syracuse is doing a lot of things well. They have a lot of individuals uh, high up in the statistical categories in the league, but it's just not computing always um, into wins and um, wins in their games. They got run by Duke at home on Saturday night. Now, Here's where things get a little bit wacky for Syracuse stat-wise. Their leading rebounder is Cole Swider, who is only averaging 6.8 per game. That's right, you're hearing me. Syracuse's leading rebounder is averaging 6.8 per game. Compare that to Armando Baycott is almost double. He's up at 12.5 rebounds a game right now. However, if you've ever watched Syracuse, you know why that is. Why is it so hard to be a rebounder in the Syracuse system? Well, it's because of that vaunted zone. If you've ever watched Syracuse, you know the deal. You know what to expect. Most teams around the country go to some type of zone uh, if they if they're in some foul trouble or need to just do something different to switch it up to get out of their man. But that's not Syracuse. They're in 2-3 zone. They ain't getting out of it. <laughs> it's been their staple under Jim Beheim. So let me just give you a little peek behind the curtain at the zone, uh, some pros, some cons, and then how Carolina is going to look to attack it so that you can be aware of like, hey, what am I watching for when Carolina's on offense tonight? How, how will they try to um, hit this zone? So some pros of running the zone uh, for, for Syracuse. It often leads to seducing opposing teams into shots they don't want to or usually take. Lots of threes, lots, lots of mid-range jumpers that jumpers that you're settling for because maybe you can't you can't drive you can't work your way into the basket do things like that we saw that on Saturday unfortunately uh, against NC State they went they switched to his own just because of the struggles they were having and it did it goaded Caleb Love it goaded RJ Davis into taking several threes that I don't think was the shot Carolina wanted Manic and Baycott combined to shoot 17 of 22 on Saturday but in that zone, uh, I, I don't know if it's because they weren't 
prepared for it, right? They're, they know they're getting it tonight, Monday, but um, Love and Davis in particular just really didn't solve it very well, I thought. And that has me a little worried for tonight is how that's going to go. So that's some of the pros of the zone is it, it's a different thing that teams aren't used to seeing. And it's going to f- not force a team, but because uh, teams can get what they want out of it if they know how to play it, but it's going to seduce, I'll use that word again, some teams into taking shots they don't want to. What about the cons of running the zone? Well, as I said, Cole Swider leads the team with just 6.8 rebounds per game, and that's because if you don't have a specific man you're guarding, like in man-to-man defense, when a shot goes up, you got to find somebody and box out, but that's harder to do because it's not you're, you're not just right there where you can turn and box out. And so rebounds, it's a lot easier for opposing teams to get offensive rebounds and putbacks and things like that and and slither in. And so Syracuse at times struggles to rebound, even though they have a lot of length and height typically in their zone. Um, Another con is that zone does open up for a lot of three-pointers. And so if you're facing a good three-point shooting team or a a team that just happens to be having a good three-point shooting day, you could be in a little bit of trouble. Now we know Carolina has had a big resurgence this year just because of all the great three-point shooting from Brady Manick, Caleb Love, RJ Davis. Leaky Black is up over 40%. Um, Kerwin Walton isn't shooting what he can do, but is very capable of hitting three-point shot. We saw what Puff Johnson did Saturday. And so if Carolina is is shooting well tonight at home, uh, things could be rough for Syracuse. Now, here's the question. How are... How, how should I be watching for Carolina to attack the zone? What will they do? Great question. Here's how you attack the zone. So it's this 2-3 that allows for something of a, a soft spot or a no man's land at the high post, which is up near the free throw line. And so what you're going to see happen is not, not with one of the guards, but uh, either like Leaky Black or Brady Manick or Armando Baycott uh, sliding in and out of that high post in an effort to get into the teeth of the defense, get an uh, an entry pass from one of the guards and then look to either kick out to somebody else on the on a wing or in the corner maybe even kicking it to the weak side or passing big to big and so if if Baycott comes into that high post maybe finds Baycott or Leaky or Puff Johnson if Leaky's not in or Dontrez Styles cutting baseline backdoor layup anything like that you you might recall there was a game a couple years ago uh with Bryce Johnson and Kennedy Meeks just carving up the Syracuse I mean it was just straight like Thanksgiving day carving the turkey uh Bryce Johnson I I don't remember for sure I don't have the numbers in front of me but if memory serves had a career high in assist that game Carolina assisted on like 70 or 80 percent of their made baskets that day, just carved it up. And so that's what you're looking to do is get into the teeth of it, get into that high post and distribute. And so if, if you can get a player doing that, that's what you want to happen. So what does this mean? If Carolina is having a good shooting night against the zone, they're going to be in good shape. Uh, regardless of what's happening defensively, Carolina will be able to do that. Although, again, defensively, they're going to have to shut down Buddy Bayheim. And Buddy Bayheim scores, and then he talks, and so you need Leaky or Puff to shut him down. Uh, the other thing it means is because of the rebounding capability, Armando Baycott is the leading offensive rebounder in the ACC. Homie should feast. Should get that 23rd double-double. I, I expect to see that happen tonight. It would be just an, an anomaly if it didn't happen. So he's going to tie Bryce Johnson with his 23rd double-double. Should be a great Thing. Now, we do know, though, that even though a lot of offensive rebounds are available against the zone, the Heels haven't offensive rebounded as the way they typically do in a Roy Williams offense. However, they had their second highest offensive rebounding percentage of the season Saturday against NC State. And then with Syracuse, there's, there's just more of them there. And so I expect Baycott, Manic, maybe Leaky or Puff to really get in there and get some offensive rebounds. Uh, Leaky status, we got to keep an eye on that. Either he or Puff will guard Buddy Bayheim. And uh, we also need to keep our eyes on the fact that Carolina is on the final leg of back-to-back Saturday to Monday turnarounds. And so lots of tired legs for the starters. Caleb Love has played all 40 minutes in back-to-back games. I mean, that's just that's just tough. Both of these teams, though, had these back-to-back 48-hour turnarounds this weekend. Thankfully for Carolina, both teams were... Um, 
traveling a little bit. Carolina was just at Raleigh for NC State and then came home. They played in an early window Saturday. Syracuse played later on Saturday up in Syracuse. They hosted Duke and then had to travel down to Chapel Hill. So definitely at a time disadvantage, definitely at a travel disadvantage, and then will not have home court advantage and won't have senior night. So a lot of things point to Carolina having the upper hand in this one, but we're just going to have to see how it plays out. It is time to send these seniors out on a high note and lock up a double bye in the ACC tournament, which Carolina will do with a win. Well, that's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. Thank you so much for checking in, tuning in, being here for this first episode of YouTube. Even if you normally just listen, I'd love for you to go to YouTube, check it out uh, at the Locked on Tar Heels YouTube page. And please go to the audio format wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. You can follow me on Twitter. You can see it right there in the lower third, but it's I-S-A-A-C-S-C-H-A-D-E. And if you like what you're hearing, please do tell a friend, get them here. Let's all be in together. Coming up on tomorrow's show, big day. We're recapping Syracuse, recapping senior night. And Tuesday is the first day of spring football practice. So we'll get you ready for that. Thank you so much for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen every single day. Now, I want to encourage you to make your second listen Locked on NFL Draft. Ryan Tracy and former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the NFL Draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts, so make sure to tune in. Thanks so much for spending part of your Monday talking Carolina with me. And remember, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until tomorrow, peace!